So today we're going to talk on deliverance from partisanship through embracing the zeal of God. deliverance from partisanship through embracing the zeal of God. As we'll go through this message, I hope that we'll not just see partisanship as in terms of belonging to one party or the other, but everything that makes us have a divisive stance, we we'll want to consider that. Amen. This is an election year, and we want to talk about these things. Unfortunately, this uh, yesterday night, yes, it was about 11 p.m., there was a mass shooting in Birmingham, Alabama. People's, I don't know if people or someone, but from the police record, it's like a group of people opened fire at, you know, a bunch of people who were out in an area that is has a lot of restaurants and clubs and people, a lot of people are there like throughout the night. So some guys just came and started shooting at the crowd. You know, four people died, 20 injured. We just pray that the number of deaths should remain at four. Amen. So our prayers go to those families. And Let's get our communion elements in hand. The word of God tells us in Joel 2.32 that in Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. The word says, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls, there shall be deliverance in our midst. There shall be deliverance on Mount Zion. And we understand from Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, the word of God tells us that we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to Mount Zion. That is the place of deliverance. That is where we have come. And Mount Zion is the city of the living God. The city of the living God is the place where the Lord is king, where the Lord is the ruler. He reigns over his people. Mount Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem. And in that heavenly Jerusalem, there is an innumerable company of angels. We have come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. We have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Amen. We love that is we have come. And it's possible for us to come here because of the sacrifice which our Lord Jesus Christ made on the cross. So as we partake of the bread and wine, we believe that it will become in us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll continue to do this in remembrance of him until he comes again. We are partaking to deliverance of anything that takes us away from the will of God. We are partaking to anything that takes us away from the will of God. We are partaking to deliverance from partisanship, from division, from the attitude or tendency to put yourselves on one side and others on the other side. We are partaking to break that down that barrier so that we will experience the unity that our Lord Jesus Christ prayed for in John 17, when he said that they may be one, even as we are one, even as I am one with my father, may the body of Christ be one with the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. So we are partaking for deliverance from that division unto 
the unity of the body, unity behind the purpose, because it is that purpose of the Lord, the plan of the Lord that unifies us. Amen. So, Father, mm -hmm. we say thank you for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you will bless it, even as we thank you for your son, whom you sent to die on the cross for us. And behold, Lord, we are redeemed from every limitation, including the limitation of partisanship, the limitation of division, the limitation, oh God, of putting ourselves on one side and classifying others as being off the other side. We say thank you, Father, because it will bring us to a place of unity for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord, let's break bread and partake. Let's partake of the cup of blessing. Amen and amen. 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 What a strange topic to talk about, but it's appropriate for the season in which we are. Amen. Amen. From partisanship through embracing the zeal of the Lord. Below, sometimes partisanship brings unnecessary stress and strain in relationships. Some people have lost their friendships and their relationships because one belongs to a party and the other to a different party. And based on whoever is leading the party at the time, they fail to agree, they fail to see eye to eye. And in an election year, Washington, the, the Washington the political season in Washington is referred to as a silly season, a season that doesn't make sense to anyone because what people believe in is not even communicated by what they say. It's not expressed by what they say because they are targeting votes. They are targeting, you know, what they tell you is not what really they believe in. And they are just saying those things because they want you to stand with them on that election day. So it is called a silly season. A silly season because families are broken apart. People challenge each other. They take different opposing stands over simple issues. And they hold on so strongly on those things as if their lives depend on them just because they have committed themselves to one side and not the other. They are not looking at the big picture. You know, the, the, the love for country is put to the shelf, but the love for party and person comes to the fore. So we are going to go through this message today to just understand some of the origins of these things and trusting that we will embrace the zeal of the Lord to set us free from these entanglements. Yes, Amen. in about 44 days, the U.S. will be voting for the President of the United States. That's the 47th POTUS, the 47th President of the United States, will be elected in 44 days. It's a big deal. It's a big deal because... The way the U.S. has gone for many years past is how the rest of the world goes. The U.S. has be, remained the world police for a long time now after destroying communist Russia, communist USSR. Amen. So whoever leads the U.S. is considered like the most powerful person, the most powerful person on the face of the earth. So it is important. And what's more important is how we conduct ourselves during a time like this as children of God. 
the question becomes, do you vote based on your party affiliation or are you voting because this is what the Lord is telling you? So let us go through this message and see. And like I said earlier, let us not limit ourselves to just partisanship as in political, but let us bring that, let's understand that anything that will cause us to want to stand on one side and place others on the other side and maybe even refuse to see eye to eye with them for as long as they remain on that other side. It's one of the things that we are asking that by embracing the zeal of the Lord, the unity that the Lord desires for us to be, will be able to come to manifest as love that will overcome these barriers in our lives. What is partisanship? The definition I found is that partisanship is prejudice in favor of a particular cause. How many of us want to be referred to as a prejudiced person? Bias, those are synonyms. Bias, one-sidedness, discrimination, favoritism, unfair preference, partiality, sectarianism, factionalism, injustice, unfairness, inequity. Now, the question you want to ask yourself as you we go through this message, a question I'm asking myself as well is, which of these synonyms would I want to be associated with myself? Do I want to be known as a factionalist, someone who disintegrates people, tries to put them in different factions? Am I dividing people to put them at loggerheads with one another? Do I want to be associated with someone who would stand for injustice just because this is the hat I am wearing right now? Do I want to be associated with unfairness or bias, one-sidedness, like lacking the ability to see the other side and make an informed judgment? Do I want to be associated with discrimination? Do I want to be associated with favoritism? Our God is not a God of favoritism. Our God is a fair and just and loving and caring God. These are some of the questions that we're asking ourselves and trusting that we will have answers as we go through this. What do we expect from our leaders? If we want to remain partisan, what do we expect from our leaders? Let's go back into the body of Christ and see the expectation that we have of deacons. If you look at the ranking of the ordained ministers, the deacons seem to be like the first level of entry into that ranking. So side by side with the secular world, we will say this is an entry level position of leadership in government. Now, I'll read to us from 1 Timothy verse 3, uh, chapter 3 from verses 8 through 13. It says, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Can you tell me a politician who is not double-tongued? And for some, I mean most, who is not given to too much wine, who is not greedy for money, there may be very few. There may be very few. So we, we cannot devote ourselves defending political parties when the leaders that we are struggling to defend, you know, are double-tongued and they're giving too much wine. They love money more than anything else. Their hearts are all given to, to, to the love of money and power. Verse 11, 
of Timothy, First Timothy 3 uh, reads, Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. If these are the expectations we have for our deacons, what should we have for our public figures? We are looking at the character. The deacons must be dignified, self-controlled, and blameless. They must also be men of character and faith. Are we demanding the same of our political leaders? In their speech, deacons must be men of their word, speaking the truth clearly, faithfully, and consistently. They must not be double-tongued, meaning they must not say one thing and mean something else. That's what we are looking for, the type of leaders we are looking for. In their conduct, Deacons must not be addicted to much wine or greedy for dishonest gain. They must also be able to manage their children and household well. Those are the characters, the, 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 the traits we are looking for. In faith, deacons must be sound in the faith and have a firm grip on the truths of the gospel. They must also hold the mystery of the faith with clear, with a clear conscience. In service, deacons should have a proven track record of faithful service before being appointed. Amen. Beloved, those are some of the traits that we are looking for in leadership. There was a presidential debate on September 10th. The, yes. On yes, September 10th, that's about 12 days or so ago. I believe that many of us watched the debate and many of us have our take from what we saw on the debate. And many of us have been paying attention to the two candidates that we have. The big question that I want us to reflect on as we move on is. Did you, listening to these people, find a deacon? Did you find someone that you would say is an overseer? Did you find someone that you would say, yes, I feel comfortable with this person leading me as someone who has a good character, who conducts themselves well? who has faith in the Lord, who would serve us diligently, who would, you know, be someone who can actually represent, represent the, the, the will of God. Did you find someone like that? If you were a pastor, did you find someone that you can make a deacon, someone that you entrust the, the, the um, well-being of the Christians, you entrust their well-being into such a person's hand. Did you find someone? Looking at these people, did you find someone? We are reminded that God is neither Democrat nor Republican. He's none of those. Our God is a just God. Amen. God is a God of the Republicans and the Democrats alike. God does not see us based on partisan distinctions or partisan affiliations. He sees all of us as his children, as his creation. Psalms 24 verses 1 to 6 tell us, say the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean's depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, 
who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob, who may climb on the mountain of the Lord, who may climb that mountain. Is it possible that we will find someone who will climb that mountain? Christians have been discouraged from getting into leadership, into political leadership. But do we find people out there who, who, who can say, these are people whose hands and hearts are pure. These are people who, who don't worship idols. These are people who never tell lies. Do we find such people? Because it is such people who will have the right relationship with God to bring the heart of God to his people. Amen. So beloved, as we go on this journey, we want to pay attention. We want to pay attention to the fact that our God is not looking at persons. He's looking at his purpose. We are talking about deliverance from partisanship through embracing the zeal of the Lord. That scripture we read from Psalms 24 talked about the earth and the world. The earth and the world. So we begin to look into it because if these two are mentioned, there is a suggestion that they are different. We know that they are different because in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, the word of God tells us, say, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Beloved, in this scripture, we see what is in the world. It's all about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, these are the three areas that are referred to as the test points for our humanity and commitment to the Lord. These are the test points of our love for God. The loss of the flesh is a test point. The loss of the eyes is a test point. The pride of life is a test point. And we are reminded that we should not love the world because the world is passing away. The world is passing away, but our God abides forever. We'll see that Satan exploited these test points when he introduced the world into the earth. The world is a system, a system that is found in the earth. Now, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 and 7, it tells us this is when Satan went to tempt Eve. He said the woman was convinced. She saw the lust of the eyes, that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted wisdom. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her 
and he ate it too. We see how they have fallen for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They took this and ate. And verse 7 tells us, at that moment their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. In verse 7, we notice that they realized that they had been deceived. They realized that they had been deceived. They realized that they had been a mutation of their DNA. They had been introduced into a new system. And that was the system of the world. A system where you know the difference between good and evil. You, don't, you now know death because you have walked away from a system where you, the kingdom, where you know just everything you know is life. And when you know good and evil, you are exposed to a new terminology known as nakedness. And the influence of that system that they had now embraced caused them to sow fig leaves. They put together fig leaves to cover themselves. Skimpy dressing that exposes your body. You just cover, you know, you top and mid sections and you expose the rest of your body. That is all an influence of the worldly system. And to this day, what they did for themselves is manifested in the two-piece uh, swim, swim wears that we, we, we use. Or for men, you just wear one piece and you are out there in maybe the ocean or the swimming pool with others, not realizing that you are partaking of a system that was introduced in the garden, a system that brought nakedness into our vocabulary. If you look at the parties today, they are dabbling with two things in the devil's tool set. And one of those things is giving strength to nakedness. The other is giving strength to money and power and wealth. Neither of those are the things that glorify our God. So we should not base our strength and our energy on the things that try to challenge the way of our Father. Having succeeded in deceiving Adam and Eve, Satan goes ahead to recruit his first agent, his first apostle, In Genesis chapter 4, we see how Cain, you know, gets angry and kills his brother. Verse 14 through 16, read, after God had reacted. He says, you, that's Cain speaking to God, you have banished me from the land and from your presence. That is the earth, the earth from the center in the garden was supposed to be the presence, the place of the presence of God. And that is the earth, that is the land. But Cain was banished from the land and from the presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of the garden. Many have asked if the Lord created the garden and put Adam and Eve there. If Cain left, where did Cain go? Cain went to the land of Nod. Nod means wandering, moving up and down, not knowing what to do. 
moving up and down, searching, searching for answers. Not having answers yet, not resting, but you just keep moving. That is the land that Cain went to. That land north, east of the garden, would have still been in the same area where Adam and Eve were. But the difference was that Cain had now become someone who was in the world and was of the world. Cain was in the world and of the world. Amen. When Christ came, he recognized that we were in the world because the worldly system had taken over. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. That is what makes a difference between us and the, the governments of this world. So Satan's plan continues because now he has introduced the world, the worldly system. It takes six generations for him to implement the plan of nakedness, to reinforce it. In Genesis 4, 17 through 19, the word of God tells us, Cain had sexual relations with his wife and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. So by founding a city, that city needs leadership. That was the first establishment of a worldly, uh, worldly kingdom, per se, with worldly leadership. Verse 18 says, Enoch had a son named Irad. Irad became the father of Mehu, Mehu Jael. Mehujael became the father of Methusahel. Methusahel became the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women. The first named Ada and the second was Zillah. So through the lineage of Cain, it took six generations for a man to realize that, you know what, I'm going to get married to multiple women and he gets married the first the second woman mentioned in the bible is ada and what does ada mean ada means adornment ada means ornament so the world view of woman is different from the earthly view of woman because the earth's view, earth as created by God, the view of a woman is the one who carries life and gives life and bears life. But the world has switched that view on woman from being that source of life to an object of lust, an adornment, an ornament something that you would look at and you may desire, something that will focus on being an attraction, being that beautiful ornament, you know, trying to do everything possible to get the attention because Satan knew that one of the tools that he has to use to bring about his own world governance and manipulation is nakedness. Now, when people mess with Satan, they have to understand that Satan has been around for a very long time. He has been around before man. And when he tempted Eve and succeeded, they brought about the fall of man in the garden. It took more than six generations. It took more than six generations before the lineage of the men who were still in the earth, men who will be in the world but not of the world to comfort and continue. 
In Genesis 4, verse 20 to 22, it tells us that Ada gave birth to Jebal, who was the first of those who raise livestock and live in tents. His brother's name was Jubal, the first of all who played the harp and flute. Lamech's other wife, Zila, gave birth to a son named Tubal Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain had a sister named Nama. Now, I talked about Lamech's first wife being ornament or adornment. Lamech's second wife, Zila. Zila means being in the shadow, like a bell in the shadow, which means you will make noise in the dark. You will make noise in the shadow. You will not be like the recognized wife, but you will be in the shadow, making noise, bringing about disturbance, confusion. So there will not be any peace when you have a zilla. There will not be peace because Zilla will be ringing like a bell, making noise, making noise, because she also needs to be heard. But she will remain in the shadow for as long as there is, there is that Ada in the house. But now look at how Satan takes over the money side. Jubal or Jabal, a pastoralist. This is the, peop, the, the set that introduced civilization. A pastoralist, Jubal, an instrumentalist. He played the harp. And Tubal Cain, a metallurgist, making weapons, making all sorts of tools that people would use. And Nama, with a pleasant and lovely vocalist. These constitute, for the most part, various variations or ramifications of other civilizations that have come after. And the things that we use come really from these four who commenced these things here on the earth. We look to them, and guess what? Their origin is from the world, the world that was introduced by Satan. So he controls all of that. He now has the wealth and the power to dominate the affairs of this world. And most people, if you want to succeed, if you want to succeed, for instance, in the music industry, you are looking at the instrumentalists, if that's the area you want to play on a musical instrument, you are looking at what did Jubal have to offer the first person who did this on the earth, coming from the lineage of Satan, from Satan's apostle. If you want to be a great vocalist, you are looking at Nama coming from that line. What did she have to offer? And with these things, beloved, the world has succeeded to introduce you know, different types of cults and organizations that will drag you over and away from the way of, of the Lord. And you look at them and you think it is the right way to go. That is, if you don't know much, if you don't know better. So Satan dominates the world. We see in Revelation 17, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 9, just speaking out of that, we see the long way that Satan has used nakedness that he introduced in the garden and money that came about by the sixth generation of Satan's, uh, or through the, the children of Satan's sixth uh, generation of his apostles. Satan has used money and nakedness to make himself the strong man of the world. The strong man of the world. And that world, as we saw in 
Psalms 24, the earth and the world, they all belong to God. Revelation 17, 2, 5, and 9, verse 2 says, The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. Verse 5, a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. Verse 9 tells us, say, this calls for a mind with understanding. Some say this calls for wisdom. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. We talked lengthily about these seven mountains of influence, which are all controlled by the Babylonian system. But that Christ came and died for us to have control over this. Yet, we are still submitting to the systems. And when they tell us about government and governance, saying Satan is at the helm of it, he has used the governments of the world to manipulate the body of Christ so that we cannot, we don't even have plans in the body of Christ to sponsor people to take over public offices. But what we must remind ourselves is that the notion of separation of church and state is not constitutional. The one who founded Rhode Island, Roger Williams, was the person who introduced the metaphor of wall, wall of separation between the church and state. And why he did that was because he believed that the government should not be involved in the affairs of the church. Else the government would come in and corrupt the church. So don't meddle. Government, you stay apart. Don't meddle in the affairs of the church. So when the church, the Danbury Baptist Association, was concerned about this in the 1800s, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to them and used that metaphor of wall of separation to describe, to, to, to tell the church and reassure the church that the First Amendment made sure that the, the, the government will not meddle into the affairs of the church. So people now use that separation of church and state, and they're talking about it for the church to feel like this is why we don't have to get involved in politics. And people will come up with all sorts of you know, doctrines to say, our kingdom is the heavenly kingdom. We don't have to reign here as kings. We don't have to rule as kings. But that was not the divine plan of God. The world and the worldly system was created by Satan after the fall of man. Amen. Beloved, it is only the zeal of the Lord that can help us to overcome thousands of years of deception, the thousands of years of establishment that Satan has established the worldly system, the Babylonian system. We don't have the ability to overcome that system. That's why we want to surrender to God and just trust in him and count on him to, for his zeal to overcome that for us. Zeal is defined as great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. And synonyms would include words such as passion or passionate, committedness, ardor, love, favor, avidity, eagerness, ardency, the appetite, the verve, the fervency, the keenness, the fondness. These are words that you could also use to express 
uh, uh, to, to, to express zeal for something. But what's the zeal of the Lord? The zeal of the Lord is God's intense commitment and passion to fulfill his redemptive purposes. His intent commitment and passion to fulfill his redemptive purposes. Genesis 3 tells us that when the fall of man, God promised that he would send his son who will crush the head of Satan. So the redemptive plan was released right there. And Satan's business has been all along to corrupt the system, to corrupt the DNA of man so that God will not be able to find someone without Satan's DNA in them, without the DNA that welcomes the knowledge of good and evil, without the DNA that welcomes the love for nakedness, the love for money. Those are the things that Satan introduced which were not there in the man that God created. God's redemptive plan is where God stands. What is the plan of God in this season? Then the zeal of the Lord will fulfill that for you. The zeal of the Lord is fueled by God's love for mankind and the fact that he is the only true God. His zeal is expressed through the sending of his son to redeem us from other gods. The people give their lives to trees and plants and stones and rivers and hills and mountains and things like that. Those become their gods. But the zeal of the Lord expressed through his son has come for those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior will be redeemed from those such gods. God also expresses his zeal in acts of judgment, where he removes things that usurp his glory and the good of the people, the things that affect the good of the people, the things that cause the glory of God to be assigned to others as opposed to God. When you stand on those things, you have the backing of the zeal of God. You have the backing of God's intense commitment and passion to make sure that his plan is implemented. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we look at the deliverance by the zeal of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 and verse 6 to 7. What does it tell us? It says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Christ is the second Adam. Where Adam fell before the first Adam, Christ, the second Adam, had to come and overcome that. The first Adam had the duty of co-dominance over all the creation of God. That is how the king, our God himself, was supposed to have Adam as a king to rule over his earthly kingdom. But when he fell, Christ had to come. That's the redemptive plan of God to restore that leadership, that kingship. And the word of God tells us that the government will be upon the shoulder of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God tells us that of the increase of Christ's government and peace, there will be no end. 
his Christ government is supposed to be increasing, and we'll be seeing that his government is increasing. Christians who partner with Christ have to be seen as bearing the government of the world of the earth upon their shoulders. We have to take over the worldly governments and make them into the kingdom of God. That is the desire, that is the, the, the position of our God, as we learn from scripture. Amen. Now, we are moving into a territory which is, which is strange, a territory which has been under a different leadership for a very long time. A territory where Satan has had his stronghold. So what does the word of God tell us? In Mark chapter 3, verse 27, Christ speaking here says, let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Before you go into bringing down governments or replacing governments with you know, the government of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have to stand on a position of strength. You have to be able to bind the, the altars and the calls and the other affiliations, the worldly Babylonian affiliations that these leaders have before you can be able to overcome and even get into such an office. Remember how we read in Isaiah 9 verse 2, in Matthew 4, verses 17, the word of God tells us, verses 16 to 17 here, the word of God tells us that the people who sat in darkness, what in Isaiah said, will see, now says, have seen, because Christ is speaking, Christ is here. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. After saying that, the word of God tells us from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, beloved, is our business. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when Christ came, he was not known by the people of Israel. So the Lord, to make that easy, had to send a forerunner. And that forerunner was John the Baptist, the baptizer. So in John chapter 1, verses 31 to 34, we get this account. John speaking here, John the Baptist speaking here. See, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. This is the purpose of John the Baptist. This was his purpose. He came to baptize with water so that Christ would be revealed through that baptism. Verse 32, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. 33, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So the second Adam has come to the world. The second Adam has come to the world so that he can redeem the world back to the Lord. Amen. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, it talks about that baptism and it says, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Beloved, we saw the baptism and how Christ was baptized in water, 
the Holy Spirit descended and alighted upon him. And after that, the, the Lord spoke from heaven, acknowledging him. I want us to see this section of scripture because it tells us how we can discern, you know, where we can go to when we lack understanding, where we can go to to receive discernment concerning what is standing before us. When you see something and you want to know if this is real or unreal, who can you check with for confirmation? First John chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 tells us, it says, this is he who came by water and blood, speaking of Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. Verse 7 of 1 John chapter 5 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. If you want to know that something is true in heaven, you want to hear what the Father will say. You want to hear what the Word will say. You want to hear what the Holy Spirit will say. So in the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are looking for that. Is he the one that we are waiting for? Verse 8 says, And there are three that bear witness on the earth. The Spirit the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So with this proves that Jesus Christ is the one, with this acknowledgement that he is the beloved son of God, we must remember that Christ was 100% human. So Christ lived a life for his first 30 years on the earth that God stamped a mark of approval on. He acknowledged that this is this my son has done it right. And typically, when a child has an A grade, if it, I mean a student has an A grade, if a student succeeds very, very well in school, they gain a promotion. So because Christ has received this approval from God, Christ gains a promotion to go ahead and challenge the strong man. So Christ is led to the wilderness. Christ is led to the wilderness because he has proven that he is an excellent student. And the test points which Adam and Eve had to deal with in the wilderness, the loss of the eyes, loss of the flesh, pride of life, those test points have to be tested against Christ again in the, in the wilderness. Why did Christ go to the why was Christ led to the wilderness? Because the wilderness is a dry place, and the dry place is where the, the, the demonic spirit lives. Christ came by water and blood. The de devil, Satan, does not have water and blood. All Satan is, is a spirit, a personality that is spirit without a physical body, can only use a physical body with the permission of that body can only use that to function here on the earth. So Christ was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When you are tempted and you overcome, you increase in rank. So now Christ, being fully man, has to go through this temptation so he can increase in rank and be able to challenge this cherub called Satan. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. Christ was 100% human, so he has needs. He felt hungry. And when you are hungry, what you want to do is to eat. 
then the tempter shows up. So Christ had appeared in the testing grounds even before Satan came. Because he was there, said, hey, I'm coming. You are here, you are the strong man. I know you are the strong man here in the world. But I'm coming to take this world and give it back to where it belongs. So if I don't see you at my baptism, I'm coming into your territory to bind you up so that I can plunder your house. Amen. So the son of man was tempted of the devil and the devil said, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. But Christ answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The loss of the flesh, that hunger, and the loss of the eyes, seeing the stones, how he could change them to bread. The pride of life, saying, yes, indeed, you want to know, you are, are you questioning my identity? I will prove to you, Christ did not fall for any of those. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against his own. Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Christ had nothing to prove to Satan. He knew his identity, that he is the son of God. He did not have to prove that to Satan. And he did not fall for the lust of the eyes after he had seen the, the, the entire city. He did not fall for that. He did not fall for the pride of life, how much all of that will, will mean to him. He did not fall for that, but he told, kept Satan in his place. The word says in Matthew 4, verse 8 to 11, he said, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Christ did not challenge that these things you don't have. By not challenging it, is acknowledging that they belong to Satan. The kingdoms of the world and their glory belong to Satan. Verse 10, then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Amen. Beloved, Amen. Christ has won that battle for us. Let's go back to what the Babylonian king saw in a vision. I chose the message translation because this chapter is Daniel 2. I'll start reading from verse 31. It's lengthy. So please just pay attention. I may not be able to explain after that. But it tells us of how the, the Babylonian system that was introduced way back in Genesis 4, how it has grown or it will grow big and how it will be destroyed. Pay attention. Verse 31 to 36 message. What you saw that's the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. The king refused to tell the dream to his people and said he is waiting for someone who would tell him his dream and give the interpretation thereof. So Daniel came forth. And now Daniel is saying, what you saw, O king, was a huge statue standing before you, striking in appearance and terrifying. The head of the statue was pure gold the chest and arms were silver, the belly and hips were bronze, the legs were iron, and the feet were an iron ceramic mixture. While you were looking at this statue, a stone cut out of a mountain by an invisible hand hit the statue, 
smashing its iron ceramic pit. Then the whole thing fell to pieces. Iron, tile, bronze, silver, and gold smashed to bits. It was like scraps of old newspapers in a vacant lot in a hot, dry summer, blown every which way by the winds, scattered to oblivion. But the stone that hit the statue became a huge mountain dominating the horizon. This was your dream. This was your dream. That's Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue, which really translates into the end of the worldly system. Verse 36 to 34 says, And now we will interpret it for the king. You, O king, are the most powerful king on earth, king of, the ba of Babylon. The God of heaven has given you the works, rule, power, strength, and glory. He has put you in charge of men and women, wild animals and birds all over the world. You are the head ruler. You are the head of gold. But your rule will be taken over by another kingdom inferior to yours, and that won by a third and a bronze, a bronze kingdom, but still ruling the whole land. And after that, by a fourth kingdom, iron-like in strength, just as iron smashes things to bits, breaking and pulverizing, it will burst up the previous kingdoms. 41 to 43 says, but then the feet and toes that ended up as a mixture of ceramic and iron will deteriorate into a mongrel kingdom with some remains of iron in it. Just as the toes of the feet were part ceramic and part iron, it will end up a mixed bag of the breakable and unbreakable. That kingdom won't burn, won't hold together anymore than iron and clay hold together. 44 to 45. But throughout the history of these kingdoms, throughout the history of these kingdoms, I'm minded to say, repeat, throughout the history of these kingdoms, the God of heaven will be building a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will this kingdom ever fall under the domination of another. In the end, it will crush the other kingdoms and finish them off and come through it all standing strong and eternal. It will be like the stone cut from the mountain by the invisible hand that crushed the iron, the bronze, the ceramic, the silver, and the gold. The great God has let the king know what will happen in the years to come. This is an accurate telling of the dream and the interpretation is also accurate. Amen. Amen. So even when the Babylonian system is seemingly flourishing, the kingdom of God is building. The kingdom of God is being built and it is growing bigger and stronger and will never be destroyed. So we cannot give up what we have for what is left, for what is passive. Amen. Christ conquered the Babylonian system. Christ has conquered that system for us. In John 19, 28 to 30, it tells us, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Before Jesus said, I thirst, he made sure that he had conquered the Babylonian system. He had conquered everything. He had taken over the world and mm -hmm. was ready to hand over that world back to the children of God. Verse 29, it said, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on high soap, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Amen. The word, 
the Greek word for it is finished. The Hebrew word rather, yes, the Greek word for it is finished. Is what is commonly used uh, at the time to say that it is paid in full. It is paid in full. So Christ had paid in full every debt that was owed. And we are free. We are free to take over leadership. Amen. We are free to take over leadership here on the earth. We understand that we are not limited from becoming political leaders. So the church needs to reorient and know what to pursue. We pursue the purpose of God in every setting where we find ourselves. Now, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 14 tells us, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? That is the position. God has his purpose, and his purpose is to fulfill this redemptive plan. He sends his angels to come and work with us to fulfill his redemptive plan. So they are neither on the side of the Republicans nor are they on the side of the Democrats. They are always on the side of the Lord. They are always there to fulfill the purpose of the Lord. And what we have to do is we have to ask, what does the Lord say to his servant? What does the Lord want us to do at this time? Instead of, you know, lining up with politicians, we need to stand in the middle and say, what does the Lord want us to do at this time? The word of God tells us in 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, it says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. They were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. This is what has become of the church. This is what has become of church leadership. This is what has become of Christians. You know, we say we are Christians. We fail to acknowledge that Christ has conquered the worldly system. And our business is to know how we, what we need to do to actually take over leadership in all of these places where Christ has conquered. Yes, they used to belong to Babylon because Babylon is the bride of Satan. When Satan was in charge, Babylon also, the position of Babylon could not be contested. Nature abhors a vacuum. For as long as Christians remain on the sidelines, Babylon will continue to rule. But when Christians step up, then Babylon has to recede because Babylon recognizes that the one who has fought and won and is in charge is Christ, and the bride of Christ has every right to benefit from the work of Christ, not the bride of Satan. Amen. But instead of us adopting those positions and standing by them, we have become like the sons of, of, of Eli. We have become like the sons of Belial. We have become corrupt people. We have become people who behave like people who do not know the Lord, people who go to the kings and are telling the kings what the kings want to hear and are begging arms from the kings. That is not what the role of the church is. The role of the church is supposed to be a people who stand in the middle to say the will of the Lord. Tell us, Lord, what you desire for us to do. And that is what we will do. We hear about this, the will of God, in Matthew 6, 9 to 11. It says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Beloved, you don't have to go to the kings of this world to beg for bread. You don't have to, you know, stand with partisan politics, wearing that hat on your head so that you can get promotion. 
so that you can get recognition, so that you can get political appointments. That is not our business. Our business is looking upon the Lord, looking on what the will of God is and doing that will, because we know that it is our Father who provides for us. So our question, beloved, has to be, what is the Father saying to you? What is the Father saying to me in this season? And amongst these people who are candidates in various offices, which of these candidates has a plan to fulfill what the Lord is saying to you? You may want to get your family together and pray without bias because you don't want to be partisan. Say, may the Lord lead us to where we should go in, I mean, what is his plan in this season? And based on the plan that the Lord has given your household, then you, you, you stand with a, a, a political uh, a party candidate. It must not be that you are just doing that because you have registered in one way or the other. Amen. Beloved, I hope that we'll find some deliverance in this thing. Because we have to understand that Satan's dominance of the, over the world is over. And what is left is passing even faster than we can comprehend. We don't have to trade ourselves for this system that is passing. We have been redeemed and have become priests and kings to share in the dominance upon the earth with our God. So get your families and friends together and ask what the plan of God is and you vote for the likely bearer of God's plan as has been revealed to you. We have to know that both the Democrats and the Republicans, they have chosen the way of nakedness and they all they have chosen the way of money and power, you know? So the biblical signs of the end times that we see manifesting, they have to be Babylonian people to propagate the signs of the end times so that Christ may return. So for us too, we have to be aware of that and not just challenge those things because the time is here and it is so. The word of God is true and it must come to pass. Amen. Once more, I just want to encourage that to remember that God is not partisan and may the zeal of the Lord lead you and your families to make the right decision in this election season. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Beloved, that's uh, what we had to share today. Do we have any quick comments before we round up here? Yeah, Daddy K, thank you for the message. Um, the message was well received from my end. I believe each and every one of us received the message too. And it's very important, like you said, um, politics or well, this topic that you talked about or you touched, it's not something that you hear more often, especially in churches or, you know, but it's very important that we understand it and we hear it and we get it and also helps us pretty much guide us to, to make best decisions or right decisions, you know, um, it's always been a lot of misunderstandings between not only partners, between people when it comes to politics, arguments. And I've been in different gatherings, even when I go to cut my hair at the barber shop. Um, you see, this set of people are for these people, this set of people are for this other person, and you know, always turns out to arguments and arguments and arguments and arguments but then again in the end what is the lord saying how is he guiding you you know that's very important because at the end of the day there's going to be a president and our responsibility 
is to respect and obey the president, you know. But we have to, in our part, like you said, pray, bring our families together, close ones, and actually pray. When it, you made a very important point about praying, yeah, we do pray, but then when you argue in gatherings like that, what do I tell people that we are arguing about? Let's just pray. Pray about it, you know. Hear what God will tell you. So I'm very blessed by this message. Um, you know, coming in this season, when election is just, you know, how many days? 44 days or how many days? 44. Yeah. It's something that, because I'm going to be voting. That's for sure. It's my responsibility to vote. You know, but then I have to pray and let the Lord guide me to make a decision that will be best, not only for me and my family, but will be best for the nation as a whole. So thank you again for this message. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank, you, thank you for this message, Pastor Kwame. Um, it came across like listening to, should I call it, something that is not Fox, that is not CNN, something like a kingdom television, you know, that is giving you perspective into how the world system should function, something that is true and that is a life versus the lies that we hear all the time. And sometimes you don't even know what, what is what. And I always tell Mother Mildred that this um, Outgivers ministry is a well-rounded, I should say, one of maybe the first top five, you know, when it comes to ministries that are well-equipped. We may be few, but then the Lord would use us to do wonders if we just align with him and do what we have to do. Um, I'm not very political, so huh, that one. <laughs> but the Lord will help me when it comes when my parent comes to my time comes to vote. Amen. And more than ever, my desire is to see the kingdom of God established here on earth and take over this. Babylonian system because the system has failed big time. Like it just it's just going south. You know, but thank you for this message. I have received it well. It was very sound. And I just give God glory for the cocktails of messages that come on this platform. You know, we are so, so well equipped, well rounded. We we listen to the Lord saying something in every aspect of life. Amen. I just I'm just so grateful to be part of this ministry. Amen. Any other quick comment? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Apostle Kwame, again for this just powerful um, word. And um, as you're just preaching, just is just Really, uh, I, I kept asking God for wisdom, uh, for wisdom, uh, because as someone who's going to vote, I see again that in both parties, there are some values that are not of God, and it's only by God's wisdom and God's grace that we are gonna be able to get that um answer from God and you know which which direction should we go with in terms of selecting our next leader. So it's only by God's grace and God's wisdom. And may all we all continue to pray uh, for our country in this country because it's it's really difficult. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, Pastor Kwame, for this message. It came very important for me because I was battling how to decide for this election. And uh, I thought I made a decision. But before this word, 
I'm still going to go back to the Lord and ask for direction because it is a very confusing time for me, seriously. And uh, the Lord really directs me when it comes to election, all of these things. But this time I'm really, really confused. So I say thank you for this word that came really on point. And I pray that all of us, uh, we do our part. Because not just our life is on the line, but uh, the life of our children. Amen. 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 Well said. Any last comment before we round up here? Okay. In the absence of that, I just want to encourage us, beloved, that it is our civic duty. It is our civic duty to vote because if you don't vote, you have voted for the person that you did not want to vote for. That's right. Yes, because that absence increases the, the margin between that person and the other person. So ask the Lord, ask the Lord, let the Lord lead you on to the polling station and you cast in that vote because our desire is to see the will of God done here on the earth. When we stand with the will of the Lord, that is what is permanent. That is what is not passing. We will never, you know, we will not fail. We'll be doing the right thing. I want to say thank you guys for your attention. And may the Lord bless us and guide us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for your word which you've brought to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we shall not only use this word to filter the partisan division in our lives, but we may also apply the principles to address every divisive situation that we encounter in life. Help us, O oh glorious God, to be able to see the angel of the Lord's armies in the situation. And may this angel speak to us every time about the position of the Lord. May we hear, Father, clearly what your stance is on the issues that affect our everyday life as we receive the grace to do your will. We say, may your kingdom come May your will be done in earth. May your will be done in our lives. May your will be done through our lives. Glorious God. May we not persecute and crucify Christ over and over. But may we walk, Lord, in the victory that he has already achieved for us. The victory over the Babylonian system. Father, we use this occasion also to pray and ask that the body of Christ shall arise and engage in public offices, that the qualities of great servant leadership that is taught or that are taught in the body of Christ that have become a part, O oh God, of our lives may also be brought into the public space as leaders of elected offices, as leaders of nations, as leaders of, of, of states, as leaders of districts, as leaders of counties, Lord, as leaders in the public space, in the market space, Father. We trust in you, Father, that even as we are praying concerning these things, the grace is released for your glory. Daddy, we honor and bless you. We say thank you, Father because you have done it in our lives. Help us, Lord, to gather together and seek your face 
concerning the way forward, even as we count down to the next 44 days. We are trusted in you, Father, that your perfect will will be done in this land. We are trusting in you, Father, that we will surrender our understanding, our knowledge, and our own priorities to you and do your will. We are trusting in you, Lord, that when we ask for what your purpose is in this season and who will carry that purpose, who will implement your purpose, Papa, that you will reveal that to us because you never leave us in the dark. So, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for the great nation that is ahead of us. Thank you, Father, for the, the next president, the 47th president of the United States. We thank you, Father, and we just bless this person ahead of time that their administration shall be successful, that the land shall be blessed, that we will prosper under this leadership for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Can we share final greetings this morning? May the grace Lord of our God. Lord Jesus Christ, the love, the love of God, God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we will be in the house of the Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Amen. Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Thank you Amen. all. Thank Have you. A blessed and fruitful week. You too. Have Thank you so fun. much. Have a blessed. See you tonight. Uh -huh.